Now on BBC Two, ghostly apparitions or natural phenomena. Join John Yates as he goes ghost hunting. Belief in ghosts is worldwide. Just about every religion and culture possessing stories of the dead coming back to haunt the living. It's often medieval castles with their dungeons, their battlements and drafty staircases where you'd expect to see a ghost and Tamworth Castle here in Staffordshire is no exception. It was after the Battle of Hastings that William the Conqueror gave Tamworth Castle to Robert de Marmion for his courage on the battlefield. Marmion was less generous to the resident nuns whom he promptly expelled. But hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and the ghost of Aditha, who founded the convent, returned to haunt him. Repent of your evil act, and let the good nuns whom you have so cruelly evicted return to Polesworth. Make reparation for this evil deed, for I hereby prophesy that you will die a miserable and untimely death. Uh -oh. Aditha, Tamworth's black lady, has been seen many times at the castle and a team from Birmingham University captured her on film in the early 1950s. Their photograph shows her as she walked down what is still called the haunted staircase. Tamworth's white lady still stalks the castle's battlements for it was here that she stood watching her lover, Sir Tarquin, being slain by Sir Lancelot in the meadows below. But it's more tangible ghosts who now seem to haunt the ancient building. As I opened up the Tamworth story, I uh, went inside, and immediately I had, I had the sensation of actually sand being thrown in my face, which makes you close your eyes. Um, close my eyes, put my hands on my face, and the sand, the grains, were actually stinging my face. And as I opened my eyes, in front of me, by the Gibson Canning's display, I saw a large cloud of smoke. So someone had had a cigar and moved out of the room. Uh, and then suddenly it moved fairly quickly towards the window, where it disappeared altogether. I think they're very playful. I'd been working during the day, and I also worked on the evening visit. So I'd been here roughly 16 hours. I was locking up the building very tired. And the one door into the Tamworth story uh, it is closed by two hooks. Every time I walked away, these hooks flipped off and parted the door. I had to put them back on, otherwise I knew that the, the alarms wouldn't set. This happened several times, and I, I was just so annoyed. In the end, I turned around and said, Look, you lot, I've been here 16 hours, I'm tired and I want to go home. Will you just pack it in? And this time they set. They stopped it. Playing the organ is Vic Tandy, a scientist from Coventry University. He believes he may have discovered the source of many ghostly sightings, and that's infrasound, very low frequency sound waves which affect the body physically. The reason for playing Toccata and Fugue is because it's got such a wide range of tones. Um, musicians call it tone, scientists would call it frequencies. So at the top end here, we've got the high frequencies, and at the low end, these would be low frequencies. If we're talking about infrasound, very low frequency sound, then that would be right down here, off the end of this keyboard, because there's no point in having an organ that can play low frequency sounds, because nobody can hear it, though you might feel it. Across the road from Coventry Cathedral, beneath the Tourist Information Centre, is a 14th century cellar, the basement of a fine house once owned by Benedictine monks. You get to it down a long, twisting corridor, and staff working at the centre and visitors shown around the cellar have often reported a strange presence and even seen grey ladies. It was a Latvian gentleman from, from Riga uh, that I brought down here, and when he got to this particular spot, he just said, there's somebody here in front of us, and they were just sort of materialising as he looked at it, and he said, it's a lady. And it's a lady who doesn't appear to have anything bottom part of her, but just the sort of head and shoulders. He said, I can't believe it. 
and he was, he was absolutely frozen to the spot. Vic Tandy had identified very low frequency as the source of a strange presence, a grey figure, that he'd seen in his own laboratory. Hearing about the cellar ghosts, he brought ultra-sensitive recording equipment and a spectrum analyzer to investigate further. There's been work done um, by NASA on the effects of infrasound. They found that it could cause disturbances of vision. Um, it can cause people to hyperventilate. Um, if you take that a stage further, once people start hyperventilating, they may feel as if they're having a panic attack. Um, and it feeds itself. So we came down here and set it all up, and a peak came up exactly on 19 hertz, which was the frequency um, that we'd identified in the first instance. Essentially what's happening in here is that um, there is a natural resonance within the building, probably uh, more to do with the corridor outside than the cellar itself. But the cellar adds the sort of spooky atmosphere that I think is, is part of seeing a ghost as opposed to experiencing other things. Does this explain away all ghosts? I think ghosts on photographs, uh, half Romans that you hold a conversation with and that sort of thing, I think they must be some sort of different effect. Our ghost trail moves to Wem, a small market town in North Shropshire, where in November 1995 the town hall was gutted by fire. As the local fire brigade fought to contain the blaze, photographer Tony O'Reilly took some dramatic still pictures of the burning building. He developed some the next day, but it was weeks later that he printed another roll, only to reveal what looked like a figure at the top of the town hall fire escape. When did you realise they weren't ordinary pictures. Um, well, I took two cameras with me. The first camera I took, I took all the films. The second camera, I took so many of them. I had some pictures of the family as well. I didn't expose them until 20 months after, and that was when I found this image on the on the film. What was your immediate reaction when you realised there was something strange on that? Well, I knew there was something there that shouldn't be there. So what I did, I go and touch the shop to start. They went interview me, took some pictures, and then we got the negatives and the pictures sent off to I think it's Kodak, and they had it analysed and they couldn't find nothing wrong with it. Interest was further increased when local historians pointed out that Wem's previous town hall had also burnt down when, back in 1677, a young girl had been careless with a lighted candle. It could be the ghost of Jane Cherm, who started the fire of Wem in 1677. And it's, it's, a good, it's a good possibility because the, uh, the site of the, the wet fire of Wem back in 1677 was about 50 or 60 yards on the other side of the town hall. Still photographs can and have been faked, but what about video evidence? Belgrave Hall in Leicester was the 18th century home of industrialist John Ellis who lived here with his daughters. Now a museum, it was five o'clock in the morning on December the 23rd, 1998, that the hall security cameras recorded something odd outside the building. We're not in the business of trying to fool the public into thinking that there are ghosts at Belgrave Hall. So what I did was to look, take the tape, ask around the country experts to look at the tape, and we got a selection of, of results from that, ranging from moths to plastic bags to ghosts. And I'm happy, personally, that the image on the tape is a leaf. But that doesn't explain what's going on inside the house. We've had two, very, two positive sightings of a Victorian lady. We've had uh, noises, um, smells uh, and other activities like that. So really what we're doing now is investigating um, what these sightings could be. Uh, at the end of the day, I have a very open mind. I'd like to think there was a ghost in Belgrave Hall. And so Stuart called in the ghost hunters. And on Friday the 13th of October, we joined a group from the Association for the Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, ASAP for short. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for coming. Um, I want to welcome West London's Ghost Club 
and the Black Country Paranormal Society. Look into all of it, enjoy yourselves, and let's hope we can scientifically prove something. Is it a good idea if we synchronise watches? I think so, yes. Oh, the weather forecast, by the way. ASAP tried to coordinate all aspects of the paranormal, from ghost and poltergeist hauntings to UFO and big cat sightings. They've been here before for their all-night vigils, each of which lasts for 45 intense minutes. They use a range of detection devices, from basic tape recorders to infrared cameras and motion-sensitive alarms. Belgrave is such a good site that tonight's group leader has given it a nickname. Initially, tongue-in-cheek, I call it the Belgrave Triangle, purely because of the church, the house and the pub are situated in, in a particular area, very close to each other and the world's media got on to that, so uh, I'm left uh, holding the baby, so to speak. But we do try and keep an objective view and, and a scientific approach to the subject. We try and find natural explanations to things, first and foremost. Um, and what we are left with is sort of sorting the wheat from the chaff, so to speak. Um, even then we can't say that it is from a discarnate source, or that it is a, a, a ghost or a, that, that type of phenomena. The Talbot Inn marks the second point of the Belgrave Triangle and is another favoured location for an ASAP vigil. The teams move in to wire up the cellars, two bars and the room upstairs. Many hundreds of years ago, Red Hill, which is only about five minutes walk from us, was a gallows. And this would have been the last call for anybody who was going to be hung there. Instead of your last meal, it would be your last drink. There's quite a bit of reported phenomena here. Um, one of the things that we're particularly interested to try and record are footsteps and the sounds of movement noises that come from upstairs when there's no one there. So tonight what we're going to do is set up the contact mic actually onto the ceiling itself in the bar area and hopefully if these sounds reoccur we'll be able to record them. We have looked into the history of the pub and the pub was originally three stories. We do know that it was a coaching inn for several hundred years and obviously there would have been guests here. The floor that we walk on is not the original floor. The original floor is lower and we think it could be people walking around who had previously occupied the pub. And that would explain why on one of the vigils with ASAP that um, they couldn't actually hear anything in the flat and yet they could hear things downstairs at the same time. While the vigil continues in the Talbot, another group make their way to the final point of the Belgrave Triangle, St Peter's Church. Things happen, of course, here in the churchyard. Certainly the Belgrave Hall and the public house, the Talbot. Things have been witnessed over the years and uh, in fact, tonight, things have been happening. One of our investigators in the churchyard, uh, this last watch, felt that he was being observed, and he knew that it wasn't the other investigators watching him. It was not a different kind of feeling, he said, um, as if he was being observed, as something was moving around him, near him, near the trees. He didn't feel that it was anything violent or, or, or frightening, but he said it was definitely a, a different feeling than having us guys look towards where he was standing. In Belgrave Hall, earlier on the first watch, one of our investigators had a, quite a, an odd feeling, uh, like a panic attack. And this is a gentleman who is not usually prone to such things. Um, also upstairs, um, a couple of uh, investigators at, on different levels heard like a female sigh. It seemed to appear between the floors on the landing on the stairs. Uh, apparently it sounded like a lady <sighs> sighing quite loudly. We've heard of weeping statues and bleeding tombstones, but at Bosworth Hall in Leicestershire there's an immovable stain on the floorboards of the room above this massive stone fireplace. The stain never dries out, and even when the ceiling below is replastered and repainted, the mark soon reappears. It's said to be the blood of Anna Dixie, Sir Walston Dixie's beautiful daughter, who was in love with a local yeoman, much against her father's will. 
One night, back in the 16th century, she slipped out of her bedroom for a date with death. As she ran to keep her secret assignation, she was caught in a deadly man trap laid by her father to ensnare her lover. All night she lay bleeding until being discovered and carried to her room, where a few days later, Anna Dixie died. Guests can now sleep in Anna's room, one of the elegant bedrooms at the hall, now a hotel, but the stained floorboards are now covered by a carpet. However, it's in the tower bedrooms that strange things continue to happen, rooms going hot and cold with no explanation, and where one guest was convinced he'd seen the Grey Lady of Bosworth Hall. He was an engineer, and he got an early flight at about three o'clock in the morning. He came down a small staircase from the tower rooms, and it's, all, it's a single staircase, it's only with one person, and as he opened the door at the top, he said there was a woman standing in the well on the corner and he thought it was perhaps one of the bridesmaids that there had been a wedding on the night before or the bride because of the long dress she got on and he beckoned and stood sideways for her to come up the stairs and in his words she blended sideways into the wall crisscrossed by coaching routes and rich in former staging inns the midlands has its fair share of ghost stories connected with the coaching era the Great North Road ran through Nottinghamshire, where highwaymen like Dick Turpin preyed on wealthy travellers. Newark people aimed to get home before nightfall to avoid a phantom coach and four driven along the road by a headless coachman. And today, roads still provide ghostly sightings, like that witnessed by a couple near Redditch in Worcestershire. Well, it was about 14 years ago, my wife and I decided to go out on the evening to go and get some petrol, um, just over the brow of the hill we noticed a figure just in front, slightly to the centre of the road, um, walking a dog, incidentally, um, figure looking quite solid. Like a policeman. Did you see that? They just disappeared. I indicated to go round the figure, and as I indicated to go round, the figure just disappeared. What did you see? Uh, I said to my wife, and she said, well, you tell me what you saw, the descriptions matched. So basically, we thought, right, we've seen a ghost. <laughs> Years later, Tony came across a newspaper article telling the story of a local police inspector, Davis, who'd been murdered on this very same road. As he was on his beat, um, somebody had actually jumped him from behind and actually cut his throat. Um, and the blame goes to um, a local man called Moses Shrimpton, who was a poacher. So do you think, really, that Inspector Davis still patrols his own beat? Possibly. Possibly. I'd like to think so. <laughs> I've come to Studley in Warwickshire to some former needlemakers' cottages where there appears to be a playful little poltergeist. Most of the things that have happened are mischievous. They're pranks that a small child might do. Um, they're not harmful. Um, it's quite a benevolent sort of thing and it's just the sort of thing a small child would do. It was, wasn't really until we started work on upstairs here that we got a lot more peculiar things happening. Came in one morning, um, as, as normal, switched all the lights on, and I found two handprints of a small child on the glass on the chiller. Um, knowing full well that I'd cleaned it the night before, before I went, and we'd had no children actually in the coffee shop the day before. Um, nothing particularly had bothered me before that point, and I just couldn't understand why I should have two small children's handprints. Ghostly handprints on the counter are one thing, but what about flying carrot cakes? I was sitting with my bank manager one day uh, up here, and um, the cake just flew off the shelf, off the, uh, the work surface, in its box, a few feet onto the floor. And there was no one else up here but the two of us. And the bank manager said, did you see that? And I said, yes. And he promptly got up and left. <laughs> In the southeast of Warwickshire is the Long Ridge of Edge Hill, site of the first battle of the English Civil War. 1,500 men were slaughtered here in 1642, and it's produced one of the best documented ghost stories of all time. On Christmas Eve that year, farm labourers and workers returning home looked up to see the very same battle being reenacted in the sky. 
They saw the advance of the king's men down the hill towards the ranks of the parliamentarians, banners flying, drums beating, trumpets blaring, the whole scene being outlined against a bright light in the sky. They saw flame belching from cannons and muskets, the clash of pikes and the charge of cavalry. The watchers heard the pounding of hooves, the shouting of orders and the cries of wounded men and animals. The phantom battle was to last for three hours until the royalist forces appeared to retreat and the apparitions vanished from sight. The ghostly conflict was repeated on Saturday and Sunday nights for some weeks afterwards and seen by so many witnesses that King Charles sent six officers from Oxford to investigate the matter. They not only saw the reenactment in its entirety but also recognized some of their friends who'd been killed in the battle. A more recent war has provided the Midlands with one of its most enduring ghost stories. Here at RF Cosford stands the haunted bomber of Hangar 457. Stories about a phantom airman in the Cosford Museum's Lincoln bomber started over 20 years ago when the aeroplane was being restored. I saw the person sitting in the seat over on the left hand side there. Um, I was rather startled at first and then the person spoke. Um, well, I think it was a person anyway. And he said, it's all right, John. And then he said, 398, RF 398, which is the number of this aircraft, will not leave this hangar. We had been told on the previous Thursday this aircraft may go to the museum. I've seen him on numerous occasions before. And it is quite a surprise that something missing something. Like that. He could be an ex-engineer. Um, he seems to be very interested in the work we're doing, in the refurbishment of the aircraft. He seems to be sort of overseeing her, I think. Um, you don't always see him, but you quite often get a feeling that there is somebody there um, just watching what you're doing. As word of the ghostly happenings got around, other investigators visited the site, and in July 1988, Cosford allowed Ivan Spensley to investigate the ghost of Hangar 457 for the Paranormal Research Society. I became involved simply because I was the one with a tape recorder who could pop out and do recordings for them. And uh, there were indeed strange sounds. The hangar lights were turned out, and there were no lights in the aircraft. I, uh, I looked toward the back of the aircraft and could see a tiny white point of light uh, which appeared to be bobbing up and down and moving along the aircraft toward me and uh, did so until it reached the flight engineer's position and disappeared. We have the sound of um, switches being operated in the aircraft or it sounds like switches being operated in the aircraft, other mechanical levers being tugged very violently we have hangar sounds, we have the sound of a, a young girl or a child shouting in the hangar. We have the sound, I'm told by pilots, ex-bomber pilots, of Merlin engines running out of sync. I really don't know, it's a total mystery. The Cosford Lincoln dates from 1945 and never saw active service in World War II, yet did take part later in operations during the Mau Mau Rebellion in Kenya. Many people believe the ghost is the phantom of a pilot called Hiller who loved flying this particular aircraft and said on his last flight that he would haunt his baby. Hiller was killed near Cosford in an air crash. Well, this is Derby, a city with a multitude of ghosts. It's also a city with an extremely gruesome past. Less than 200 years ago, they were still hanging, drawing and quartering convicts, and the last public execution took place in 1862. So no wonder Ghost Walk Guide Richard Felix is a very busy man. And I think that the energy used by the body in resisting death, the electronic impulses given off by the brain moments before death, can be so immense that the actual events just before death can be recorded into the fabric of the building. Now for some reason, perhaps the anniversary of the event, it's seen again. There's a shop in Saddlergate called Poynton's and again doing a ghost walk for them one night, the lady on it said, we've got a ghost in our shop. And I said, I didn't know anything about it. They said, oh yes, she said, we have a, a, a little stooped lady in black. In the daytime, she wanders through the shop, even when there's customers in there. She always disappears through the jigsaws. 
and I found that highly amusing until one night going up the alleyway at the side of the shop I noticed that there was a, a bricked up doorway and in fact got back in touch with Poynton's and on the other side of the wall there the jigsaws and in other words she uh, A doesn't know that the jigsaws are there she also doesn't realize that the doorway's been bricked up and she's obviously making her last journey not only through the jigsaws but through the bricked up doorway to wherever to whatever happened to her just outside And you've got all that. Oh. I'm not telling you nothing anymore. <laughs> There's tunnels linked between the Tiger Inn and the old um, lockup where the prisoners were, were taken down to be tried and then executed. And a few years ago, uh, there was a little boy seen underneath the Royal Bank of Scotland. They were demolishing the old building and a workman was, was clearing up, looked into the um, hole that had appeared and he could see into the cellar and sitting on the floor of the cellar was a little boy of about six wearing rags. Um, the chap actually spoke to him and said to him words like, what are you doing here little boy? Um, and the little boy spoke to him said, I live here and vanished. That was 27 years ago and he still plays havoc with the Royal Bank of Scotland, even to this day. The lift operates itself, coffee cups move, papers float, and he's very fond of the five pound weights. He skims them across the, the counter of the bank and they take off. He does not move, I can assure you. Rubbish. <laughs> It, it's the damp, you know, it gets into his bones, and it... <laughs> now look, let me just explain where we are. You're, you're underneath the old mule hall, and these tunnels were last used during the Second World War as air raid shelters. And, and a lot of these rooms down here were full of cardboard coffins. Flat packed cardboard coffins that were used to be used if there was a big air raid in Derby. Why do you think there are so many recorded sightings here? We were the assize town from the from medieval times, um, and people were executed here, imprisoned here, tried here. The amount of suffering that must have gone on here at this place, which I call the crossroads of history, is is possibly one of the reasons why there are so many souls still lingering. So what are ghosts? Surviving memories of someone who's died, or an event imprinted in the fabric of a building which is then triggered like a videotape? Or perhaps there's even some more mundane reason. Whatever the case, nearly everyone you meet has a story to tell. BBC Two, ghostly apparitions or natural phenomena. Join John Yates as he goes ghost hunting. Belief in ghosts is worldwide. Just about every religion and culture possessing stories of the dead coming back to haunt the living. It's often medieval castles with their dungeons, their battlements and drafty staircases where you'd expect to see a ghost. And Tamworth Castle here in Staffordshire is no exception. It was after the Battle of Hastings that William the Conqueror gave Tamworth Castle to Robert de Marmion for his courage on the battlefield. Marmion was less generous to the resident nuns whom he promptly expelled. But hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, and the ghost of Aditha, who founded the convent, returned to haunt him. Repent of your evil act, and let the good nuns whom you have so cruelly evicted... And as I opened my eyes, in front of me, by the Gibson Canning's display, I saw a large cloud of smoke, as though someone had had a cigar and moved out of the room. 
and then suddenly it moved fairly quickly towards the window where it disappeared altogether. I think they're very playful. I'd been working during the day and I also worked on the evening visit so I'd been here roughly 16 hours. I was locking up the building very tired and the one door into the town of story uh, it is closed by two hooks. Every time I walked away, these hooks flipped off and parted the door. I had to put them back on, otherwise I knew that the, the alarms wouldn't set. This happened several times. And I, I was just so annoyed. In the end, I turned around and said, Look, you lot, I've been here 16 hours. I'm tired and I want to go home. Will you just pack it in? And this time they set. They stopped it. Turn to Polesworth. Make reparation for this evil deed, for I hereby prophesy that you will die a miserable and untimely death. Uh... Editha, Tamworth's black lady, has been seen many times at the castle, and a team from Birmingham University captured her on film in the early 1950s. Their photograph shows her as she walked down what is still called the haunted staircase. Tamworth's white lady still stalks the castle's battlements, for it was here that she stood watching her lover, Sir Tarquin, being slain by Sir Lancelot in the meadows below. But it's more tangible ghosts who now seem to haunt the ancient building. As I opened up the Tamworth story, I uh, went inside, and immediately I had I had the sensation of actually sand being thrown in my face, which makes you close your eyes. Um, close my eyes, put my hands on my face, and the sand, the grains, were actually stinging my face. Playing the organ is Vic Tandy, a scientist from Coventry University. He believes he may have discovered the source of many ghostly sightings, and that's infrasound very low frequency sound waves which affect the body physically. The reason for playing Toccata and Fugue is because it's got such a wide range of tones. Um, musicians call it tone, scientists would call it frequencies. So at the top end here we've got the high frequencies and at the low end these would be low frequencies. If we're talking about infrasound, very low frequency sound, then that would be right down here off the end of this keyboard because there's no point in having an organ that can play low frequency sounds because nobody can hear it, though you might feel it. Across the road from Coventry Cathedral, beneath the Tourist Information Centre, is a 14th century cellar, the basement of a fine house once owned by Benedictine monks. You get to it down a long, twisting corridor, and staff working at the centre and visitors shown around the cellar have often reported a strange presence and even seen grey ladies. It was a Latvian gentleman from, from Riga uh, that I brought down here, and when he got to this particular spot, he just said, there's somebody here in front of us, and they were just sort of materialising as he looked at it, and he said, it's a lady. And it's a lady who doesn't appear to have anything bottom part of her, but just the sort of head and shoulders. He said, I can't believe it. And he was, he was absolutely frozen to the spot. Vic Tandy had identified very low frequency as the source of a strange presence, a grey figure, that he'd seen in his own laboratory. Hearing about the cellar ghosts, he brought ultra-sensitive recording equipment and a spectrum analyzer to investigate further. There's been work done um, by NASA on the effects of infrasound. They found that it 